writer and writer write two pages every single day and soon you've written a book. And you, you just said that earlier, Matt, it's something like two minutes a day or two actions per day. Mm -hmm. Th that is how you become a champion vegan bodybuilder or how you, you qualify for Boston Marathon. You do these little things every day and they accumulate over time and there you are. Welcome to the Mastering Diabetes audio experience where we'll teach you how to reverse insulin resistance, achieve your ideal body weight, gain energy, and get your best A1C following almost 100 years of evidence-based research. We're on a bold mission to reverse insulin resistance in 1 million people. We're glad to have you joining us. Welcome to the Mastering Diabetes Audio Podcast. Today we have an incredible conversation with two incredible gentlemen. The first one is named Matt Frazier and the second one is Robert Cheek. Both of them have co-authored the book called The Plant-Based Athlete that is going to become available starting June 15th, 2021. So in today's conversation with them, we're going to go deep into uh, many aspects of why a plant-based diet is an ideal diet for somebody who's trying to live an, uh, an active lifestyle. And just for clarification, we're not necessarily talking about people who are trying to become elite athletes. We're not talking about people who are collegiate athletes or professional athletes in any way, shape, or form. We're literally talking about why a plant-based diet can benefit you if you are trying to be a little bit more active, even if you just want to walk some more or run with your grandkids or take your dog for a walk or go to the gym more often. So in this podcast, we kind of do a lot of talking about plant-based nutrition, a lot about athletics. You'll learn about Matt, you'll learn about Robert, and uh, really kind of like start to think about plant-based diet from a different perspective, which is why it's such an interesting conversation. Now, uh, Matt himself uh, is, is Matt Frazier, and he's a vegan ultra runner turned soccer dad. He's actually best known as the founder of the No Meat Athlete movement and the author of the No Meat Athlete cookbook. Uh, now, Matt himself found that he could run faster and run longer when he began eating a plant-based diet. And after eating a plant-based diet, he actually qualified for the Boston Marathon and completed his first 100-mile ultra marathon soon after qualifying for Boston. Uh, he splits time between Charlotte and Asheville with his family. Uh, he's a really exceptional guy. He's got a lot of wisdom. Uh, he's got a lot of athletic experience. And uh, on the podcast today, you're going to learn a lot from him. Cyrus, I want to echo what you were saying there about this book and this information being for anybody who just wants to be more active. You don't need to be an Olympic athlete. You don't need to be pursuing the Olympics to want to decrease inflammation. We talk about that a lot. So you're going to just start getting exercising. You're going to start walking. You're going to want to feel less uh, aches and pains the next day to do that next walk and to keep it going consistently. So that's a huge part of this podcast. And let me tell you about Robert Cheek. He is a champion vegan bodybuilder and the founder of Vegan Bodybuilding and Fitness. He's the author of Shred It and Plant-Based Muscle and is a contributor to No Meat Athlete, Forks Over Knives, Vegan Strong, and other popular websites. He lives with his wife and two rescued chihuahuas in Fort Collins, Colorado, and has followed a plant-based diet for more than 25 years. So I had the pleasure of working with Robert Cheek at Forks Over Knives for a little bit when the movie came out. We got to do some fitness together. It's a really inspiring guy, and I think you're going to feel that in today's episode, so I really hope you guys enjoy it. Absolutely, and uh, one thing that you can do is, uh, if you're interested in getting your hands on their book as you learn more about it, um, you can do a, a number of things. You can go directly to Amazon and purchase it there. You can go to Barnes & Noble, purchase it there. You can go to a local bookstore and try and purchase it there. That's always something that we recommend. Um, you can also go to book.nomeatathlete.com. That's book.nomeatathlete.com. And if you go there up until June 19th, they have a whole bunch of free bonuses that you can take advantage of um, by simply going through that route. So just like Robbie said, we hope you enjoy this, uh, this podcast. And uh, let us know if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. You know exactly how to find us. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Here we are with the, uh, the greatest athletes on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, Matt, welcome to the uh, Mastery Diabetes Audio Experience. It's awesome to have you guys here today. Thank you, guys. Looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you. We are so pumped for this, and you, you cannot stop us. You can only hope to contain us. That's an inside joke with Robbie. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Congratulations on the book, guys. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. It was, uh, what, two years' work in progress, right, Robert? Yeah, yeah. A lifetime in the making, I like to say it. But, um, but definitely, yeah, the last two and a half years dedicated to this project. 
Yeah, so for those of you, uh, you know, who are new to the Mastering Diabetes Auto Experience or don't know who uh, Matt and Robert are, uh, they are two phenomenal athletes who have been plant-based for many years, and they've been uh, uh, ripe on the scene to try and educate people about the benefits of a plant-based diet, and their target audience is to talk to people who are athletic. So today's podcast, we're going to be talking about, you know, the interplay between plant-based nutrition and athletics. Um, but if you feel like, hey, I'm not an athlete, like I would never refer to myself as an athlete, don't worry because there's a lot of psychology that goes into this approach as well. And we're going to talk about everything from sort of soup to nuts here, pun intended. So the new book that you guys got coming out is called The Plant-Based Athlete. And when is the actual release date? June 15th in every major bookstore in America, June 15th. And uh, it's, it's going to be super exciting and we hope that everyone checks it out and loves it. Absolutely. Okay, cool. This is going to be a, this is going to be a great book. I can't wait to read it myself. So first question for you guys here. Um, for those uh, people who are sort of new to eating a plant-based diet, uh, what tips do you guys have for achieving long-term success? Because it can be a big change from, you know, the way that they've been eating over the course of time. So what can people do to make sure that they, they make the habit change and it sticks with them in the long term? Well, I'm a really big fan of, uh, small steps to habit change, like really just taking the smallest possible step you can. I think so many of us, uh, well, I know I have made the mistake of just assuming that we're going to make a change or we get all inspired. Then we say, that's it tomorrow. Everything changes. Or right now in this instant, I'm, you know, flipping the switch. And from now on, everything's going to be different. And I'm going to start exercising and also and meditating and doing all these things. And that usually lasts a day, two days. It's not even less than that. It just, it just doesn't last. Uh, so a diet change even by itself is, is a huge endeavor. Uh, so to just go plant-based overnight or something like that, I mean, there are people who make that work and, and, you know, it's, it's possible that you'll see the results fast enough that like that kind of snowballs and you get excited. Um, but you know, there's, there's a big drain on your willpower when you change something like your diet. So I'm a huge fan of, of kind of, uh, really finding like the very smallest step you can. I have a good friend, his name is Sid Garza Hillman. He does, uh, you know, like nutrition counseling for people. And, uh, he, he actually starts people by just like, adding a stalk of celery to their diet or, or literally eating, drinking a glass of water first thing, like the smallest possible change you can, you can make just to kind of start keeping a promise to yourself. Um, you know, very, something that you can't possibly fail at. So you can do more than that, I think. But, but to me, I think like you're a lot better off kind of changing one meal at a time, maybe replacing that your breakfast with something that, that is, you know, fits your goals. Um, rather than like saying, I'm switching my whole day starting now. Uh, so, that, you know, I think that's probably the, the biggest advice. And, like, it, it could kind of take different shapes. It could be that you're just going to eat your plant-based diet on one day a week or something, and you're going to do it perfectly that day, and then gradually you add more of those days. Lots of ways you can do it. Um, but, but overall, just the theme for me is, like, be, be easy. Go gentle on yourself, easy on yourself, uh, and, and go slowly. And that's not just Matt's perspective. Um, you mind if I just chime in? And that's not just Matt's perspective. Um, statistics show that the, the 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 progressive step, the small incremental changes, are most likely to uh, be ones that you stick with for the long term. You know, rather than making a decision immediately overnight and and hoping that's going to be something you're still doing five, ten, twenty years down the road. That's not necessarily the case. There have been uh, studies on this. Uh, in fact, even with vegan vegan strong, we did some uh, uh, national polls on this, uh, surveying thousands of people. And, and people come to a plant-based diet for, for health reasons specifically, uh, kind of, that's not necessarily ego or selfish reasons, but that's what brings them there for health reasons. And if you make some small incremental changes uh, that you can adapt to over time, you're more likely to stick with, stick with it for the long haul and therefore reap the benefits of a plant-based diet for the long haul as well. And as much as we'd all like to change overnight uh, for our own benefit of like just all of a sudden getting super healthy and fit and happy overnight, uh, it, that doesn't always work for everybody. And so one thing that I like to encourage people to do is to determine what your favorite foods are. Like, what are your favorite plant-based foods? Like, really uh, be aware of those. And if you can have those at your disposal, if you can have them uh, close by in your kitchen, in your pantry, uh, on your counter, like like Brian Wendell or Robbie Barbero, uh, big racks of fruit, whatever it is that moves you, those are the foods that you're going to eat. And, uh, and our good friend, Chef AJ, when discussing some of these temptations of junk food and such, uh, she says, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. And that's, that's unequivocally true. Uh, w when, I, when I get some non-dairy ice cream, you know, vegan ice creams and all these things, and I, you know, I'm not going to touch them for a long time, but 
you know, willpower can only last for so long. And then I, I just want it. It's there. I paid for it. It's, it's not going to eat itself. It's wasted money if I don't. And then I do that. But we do that with collectively as a society with, uh, with convenience foods, with chips and with cookies and with snacks and all of that. When really what we're really seeking are those 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 pleasure senses from foods like like mango and raspberries and blueberries and pineapple uh, foods that that have that sweet taste that we're drawn to um but th but this decision also comes with vitamins minerals antioxidants water and fiber and then all of a sudden oh that's how that fits into my active lifestyle that's how it supports my recovery after exercise that's where i get the energy from to go put my shoes on and go out the door for a walk in the first place and so that's what i'm really really big on understanding the foods you're eating and why you're eating them and then making those conscious decisions so then you get the right foods in front of you at the right times and it nourishes and fuels you to become the best version of yourself. Beautiful. Very well said. So people listening to the show, they are living with some form of diabetes. They are a healthcare worker. They're focusing on people living with diabetes. So can you guys talk to us how your book can help people living with diabetes or any chronic disease trying to become more active. Is that something that people would benefit from? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's one of those things like, like Dr. Michael Greger, who wrote the foreword for our book, says you know, that a plant-based diet should be the default diet until proven otherwise because it has the greatest impact on overall mortality rates. It has just the, the ability to prevent and in some cases uh, reverse some issues that we have uh, that are diet and lifestyle related. So it's the best shot that we've got. Uh, and I like to look at it from uh, the, the nutrient density perspective of nu nutrition per calorie, nutrients per calorie. And we can talk about the aggregate nutrient uh, density index uh, from Dr. Joel Furman and the kind of the bang for your buck you get from eating specific foods, making leafy greens the, the top choice with uh, the nutritional return that you get from consuming those. Uh, all the way down to fruits and legumes, uh, nuts, seeds, grains, um, all down the line with their respective scores and this Andy score. And these are the things, Robbie, that will benefit people with any kind of, uh, or for most, I should say, uh, qualify this with most uh, diet and lifestyle diseases. Uh, it can help so much with um, with ob obesity and with um, damaging of endothelial cells and clogged arteries and uh, with improving energy. And the big one, this is the real big one, this is the theme throughout our entire book, is the ability to reduce inflammation. Inflammation is the Achilles heel of the American diet, the Western diet. And if we can tackle that, uh, pun intended, uh, with, with an athletic and health approach to, I'm going to incorporate movement. And Robbie, I'm not talking about you know, putting on spandex and a bandana and going to, you know, Venice Gold's gym. I'm talking about exercise that means something to you, taking your dog for a walk, going dancing uh, with your with, with your partner or on your own, uh, going for a hike in, in fresh air. These have myriad benefits uh, to doing so. Um, so the, the, the benefits of a plant-based diet, especially supported with an active lifestyle, will really help uh, people with all kinds of chronic issues. And the number one thing that we've seen is the reduction of unwanted body fat, the improvement uh, uh, with recovery and reduced inflammation, and overall, what I would really qualify as an, an improved quality of life, basically a pursuit of happiness, right? I now feel happier because I'm healthier, and that's why I feel happier. Just to add to what Robert said, one of the cool things about a plant-based diet is that the foods that, that you would eat that would support your short-term athletic performance, they're the very same foods that support long-term disease prevention and reversal. There's a little bit of a shift to focus in like, you know, making sure that as an athlete, you're getting enough calories to sustain your activity levels. But especially for someone at the very beginning of, of becoming active, uh, you know, that's not going to be a huge issue. So, you know, by, by eating like an athlete, eating like the, the foods in the plant-based athlete, like we talk about, you're really eating in a way that, that is going to be just healthy, you know, overall for your, for increasing longevity, increasing health span, uh, all these things. But, you know, you can, to me, I think there's a huge psychological component to just feeling like you're eating like an athlete. I know if I'm, if I'm like, you know, say I'm into vegetable juicing or something, or I'm eating light breakfast and it's, the weather's good. Like I just feel better. And I just, I'm just more likely to want to take a longer walk with my dog than I typically would, or want to go for a jog even. 
Um, even in periods when I'm, when I'm not, you know, not that active. And I certainly go through those times when I'm not that active. But to me, a lot of times the, the change starts with the diet. And for, I also think like for someone who's kind of at the very beginning and they, they need to make a major health change, I actually don't always suggest that they, I know, I know like the typical doctor advice is, well, you got to start eating right and you have to start exercising. I would say, like going back to the small steps thing, I would say figure out the diet part first. Like you don't need to add exercise. You don't need to add an extra stress on your willpower because it's the same willpower that's getting drained, whether you're exercising or you're trying to eat new foods. Uh, and I don't think you need all that working against you. So I say like get the, get the diet going, like get that happening. And once you're inspired to start moving because you're feeling better, you're seeing the weight come off and you're eating like an athlete, then I think then you start getting yourself, you know, whatever you whatever it is whether it's taking a longer walk whether it's taking a yoga class whatever but you know there are certainly lots of benefits cardiovascular disease prevention cancer risk reduction uh bone health i mean all kinds of things come from exercise so it's definitely worth incorporating um but i don't think it needs to be this thing that like we think of as this dreadful activity that we just have to do i would say like if you can approach it in a way where it it starts off being just a little bit fun i think eventually that can lead to to uh, you know a race goal or something that actually is kind of represents a transformation in, in who you are. I can't even tell you how excited I am that you guys are writing this book. I mean, as you guys are talking, I'm just like, I have about 700 things that are running through my head right now. So I'll try and put them all down right here in the next 60 seconds. First things first, uh, you guys both hit it on the head, which is recovery, 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 right? When I personally transitioned to a plant-based diet, I was 22 years old, okay? I had been an athlete my entire life, playing soccer, lifting weights, running, playing baseball, you name it, right? By the time I was 22 years old, I felt like I was living in the body of somebody who was 80 years old. Like I could feel it in my joints. I could feel it in my muscles. And I was eating a, you know, I was eating a, you know, quote unquote healthy diet. And then I transitioned to a low carbohydrate diet with things like turkey, burgers, and eggs, and bacon, and cheese, you name it. And I, it almost felt like every single time I put more of those foods into my body, it's like my muscles were getting tighter and more inflamed. And I could actually feel it on my body, right? I made the transition. I said, you know what? I'm going to do this plant-based thing. Uh, this is back in 2003 when it wasn't cool. I switched over and all of a sudden it was like I took a wall charger, I stuck it in the wall and it, I just got electrified with energy. I noticed a couple of things. Number one, I was more hydrated. Number two, I had way more energy. Number three, my blood glucose was easier to control. Number four, my insulin use was down. But number five, I could recover so quickly from long endurance exercise and also from resistance training that it was almost like I had this unfair advantage. So I would go and I would do a hard workout and then I would normally expect, okay, well, I got to wait 24 hours before I go do my next workout. And then when I started that second workout, I'd have to stretch a lot and I'd have to like work off a lot of the residual soreness. But I would go back less than 24 hours later and it, it literally felt like I hadn't even worked out the time before, right? And this has gotten better and better and better over the course of time. So my question to you guys is, have you guys personally felt something similar where you almost feel like you can work out, you know, maybe 20, 30, 40% more and you actually are able to, you know, improve your performance and recovery at the same time? Yeah, for me, uh, if you don't mind, Matt, or do you want to go ahead? No, go, Robert. I'll, I'll chime in after you. Uh, I, I mean, I'm eager to talk about it too. I think we all have examples just like this. Yeah, yeah. So, Cyrus, for me, I'm, this is, I'm in my 26th year as a plant based athlete. And now I'm in my forties and my recovery is, is through the roof. Like, that's the thing. Like I, I'm, I'm lifting heavier weights than ever before. My soreness is down. I'm able to recover. And I'm, I'm even kind of wondering like, Hey, where's the soreness I used to feel before? Uh, even though I've been a plant-based athlete since I was a teenager, it just, to me, it's a testament to the longevity of this diet and also how the diet evolves. Right. I mean, I used to use tons of sports supplements that were, you know, plant-based a decade ago. And now I focus much more on, uh, on whole foods and, and getting the nourishment from the best nutrient return on investment per calorie. And I noticed something there. In fact, I, uh, I gave an example in the book and, and Robbie, it has to do with when I used to train uh, with Capel and Brian, where it, it, a great scenario was we would jog down to um, Santa Monica pier, do a really intense workout in the sand with Capel Clark. It was just so tough. And then, you know, for our recovery, you know, cool down, uh, jog or walk back. And then we would load up on things like stone fruit, just as much as we could eat uh, of, of peaches and nectarines and apricots and all that. And it was just the, it, it was just replenishing. It was re replenishing carbohydrates, electrolytes, water, everything all there. And it was just so nourishing and refreshing. And then I would maybe go have a, a heavier meal with potatoes or beans or lentils, rice or something like that later on. But 
this type of deliberate uh, uh, of, of warm up, of intense workout, of cool down, and and using the right type of fuel has made my recovery uh, fantastic. And it's I, I I didn't know that I would be able to say that I've been the biggest and strongest in my life in my 40s, especially when I was a champion bodybuilder in my 20s. But here we are, and the people that we interviewed for the plant-based athlete, uh, more than 50 elite plant-based athletes, that has been the similar theme that is kind of woven through all of their stories is that I recover better. My inflammation is down. My performance is better. I'm less sore. I have more energy. So what you're talking about, Cyrus, I'm sure what Matt's going to talk about, what I just talked about, it seems to be universally true, uh, even in anecdotal form. There's just case after case after case after case of people who say this worked for me and it's it's really rewarding to tell those stories yeah i think i think if if we had to say there's a single mechanism by which a plant-based diet works so well for sports it's to me it's not the one that says like you know well the beet juice or whatever helps you helps you run longer and and faster and like it's true there there are some really great plant-based foods that help you in the moment but for me the reason the plant-based diet is is starting to be the diet of choice for a lot of pro and elite athletes is exactly what you said, the recovery benefit. And that's due to the anti-inflammatory you know, properties of so many plant-based foods just by default. Uh, and the way that I discovered this, I was a marathon runner and I was stuck. I tried, tried to qualify for the Boston Marathon. I had taken 90 minutes off my time, was still 10 minutes shy. So I ran a 450 marathon for my first one, needed a 310. I was still 10 minutes shy of it. And I, I was like almost at the point of giving up and I had decided to go vegetarian, not, not yet vegan, just vegetarian for ethical reasons. I just wasn't at all about performance. Uh, And I thought, who knows what will happen? I'm going to start a blog about how this works. I'm still, you know, want to make this thing happen. I just don't know if I'm going to ever qualify for Boston. Well, six months after that, I qualified. And, like, I wasn't doing it for that reason. I wasn't expecting that. But it just happened that I was able to get in more and harder workouts than I'd ever gotten in before. It's not that I was, like, able to, to nail these workouts better or faster in the moment. Like I said, it's just that, like you said, I was able to come back the next day and the next day and the next day. And... Previously, when I had done this same kind of attempt at like really ramping up mileage and getting there, inevitably, when things were going well, two, three weeks later, an injury was going to come. It's just, and that's how running is because you don't really realize you're doing the damage until two or three weeks later once it's too late. And so that's, that's like the, the flip side, or really the, the analog of, of better recovery is also less injuries, right? Like now it doesn't necessarily prevent like, you know, immediate uh, acute kind of injury, but like as far as overtraining goes, if you're better recovered, then instead of coming back at, at 95% of what you were the day before, and then again and again and again until you get injured, you come back a little bit better than you were before. And to me, that's, that's the huge difference that, that a plant-based diet makes. Um, works for running, works for, worked for me for ultra marathon running, uh, it works for strength training, and, and you're seeing it in, in all these even mainstream sports nowadays. And I think it's because of that. Yeah, I love it. I mean, I'm glad to hear that you guys have actually felt the same thing because I felt it. And I've talked to so many different athletes who have also felt it. And even in the movie, The Game Changers, you heard about this. You know, they even talked about the fact that recovery can get accelerated when you're providing a micronutrient rich, nutrient dense plant based diet. It's it's not a leap of faith in order to really understand this, but it's, uh, you know, it's one thing to understand it from a scientific perspective. And then it's another thing to do it yourself. And as soon as you do it and you feel it, all of a sudden you're like, whoa. Why haven't I been doing this for the last 20, 30, 40 years, right? And, and that's what I think is going to catch on, Cyrus, is that it's, it's something you can look at it from an academic perspective and from a, from a, a, you know, a talking head, a, a scientist, or someone who maybe doesn't speak your language. But the moment you experience something for yourself, that is where the light bulb goes off. That is, and that has been true for me. That has been true for so many people in so many areas of nutrition and fitness. If you're just willing to give it a try and stick with it and be consistent and allow your body to adapt, you can improve and you can experience these things that make you ask that question. Why didn't I do this sooner? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. So, so in your book also, you guys had mentioned that you interviewed 50 world-class plant-based athletes. And um, I know that there's, without a, without a doubt, there's a lot of people who are listening to this podcast and they're like, I'm not a world-class athlete. Yeah. I'm, I'm no no shot at being a world class athlete. I don't even care about being a world class athlete, right? So neither if, are we, by the way, right? I mean, we're totally normal guys who who have done well for ourselves, but like it's not neither of us is a pro or elite athlete, you know? Yeah, there you go. I mean, I would put you guys in the elite athlete category personally, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> so if 
if you're not a Rich Roll, you're not a Dotsy Bausch, if you're not a Rip Esselstyn and you haven't set world records or are on the path to doing so, you know, what, what information, what, what, what is your sort of like quote unquote average athlete stand to gain by making this transition? And especially like you said, Matt, you know, doing it slowly, not necessarily feeling like, oh, I have to change to a plant-based diet and then I have to start exercising really hard right away, right? So kind of like give some people some insight here into like how they can actually do this mechanically so that they get the benefits of it and it doesn't become overwhelming. Yeah, so I mean that's that's kind of a lot of questions in one. I think uh, one of the one of the great things about this book that I that I love about it that I didn't really realize until I read it in its final form was that when you get all these different athlete perspectives, uh, it's not just one person's you know you know crazy approach to making a plant based diet work. Because if you read one person's book, it's like you think that's the only way to do it, um, and that and that you have to be really careful doing this plant based diet and to do it this way. But you see all these different athletes who do it entirely differently. I mean, they all have in common that they eat plant based foods exclusively, and most of them choose a lot of whole foods, but not all of them. Some choose Beyond Burgers and whatever. Um, but so like. It just helps you see that this diet isn't isn't one you have to like be careful about and make sure you get right or else you're going to screw things up. It, it's it's a diet that that is is flexible and like you, you there are so many ways to make it work because every single food that you're putting into your body is is itself almost like a miracle food. I mean it's just it's just it's full of all these great inputs so it's kind of hard to screw up the combination of those inputs. Um, so that's that's the first part for me. It's just sort of like you can see what all these other people are doing. So then you as as a recreational athlete, a weekend warrior someone who just walks the dog and wants to go farther, you can, I think the inspiration of seeing what other people are doing, pros, elites, people who are at a level that you or we are never going to get, uh, but then you get to eat the same breakfast as, as this you know, weightlifting champion does or this incredible soccer player or track star or whatever. Like, you, can eat, you can do the exact same things they're doing. And to me, that has a huge inspirational and psychological benefit in itself. So there's that. But then that's also going to really help you. I mean, that, if, if an elite athlete is choosing that, and it's fit for, for their needs, which are, which are extreme in many cases, uh, it, almost without fail, it's going to be really good for you too. Like I, I say almost because there are exceptions. There are people who eat a whole lot more calories than like a typical recreational weekend warrior might want to eat. But, you know, the, they're eating it because it's, it's, I hate to use the word superfood and, and miracle food or any of these sort of hyperbole, but like they're eating it because it does so much for them. And it's like, it is the best food they could choose to fuel these endeavors. So what's it going to do for you who just wants to get through a work day without feeling a, a lull in the middle of the day or, you know, who wants to run that 5K a minute faster than you've done before? It, it's the same foods. I mean, it's, it, their needs aren't different than yours other than the amount of calories that they're consuming. Uh, so, you know, it's, to me, there, there's both that psychological, motivational, inspirational part of it. Uh, also, the confidence it just gives you to see that these athletes are all doing this and that you can follow a diet really similar to what is working great for somebody. And then, and then there's the actual physiological benefit. I, mean, I think just seeing what the best in the world are doing and what foods they are choosing uh, is going to help you make those same make the choices that are best for you too. And Cyrus, from a literature standpoint, the the stories in there that are woven through the entire book, dozens of interviews, and day in the life routines, and grocery shopping lists, and stories of inspiration and motivation and mindset are there to make it a really, really enjoyable read. Like. I mean, I've uh, obviously having co-authored the book, I've, I've read it many, many times and I still get moved by these stories because Cyrus and Robbie, some of these athletes were not destined to be the best in the world or even good. Some of them even, they started their athletic pursuit in their mid twenties, which is almost unheard of to then go on and win an Olympic medal, like the case in Dotsie, the case of Dotsie Bausch. And she also overcame an eating disorder. Um, you know, suicide attempts, a drug addiction, like some things that, you know, many of us can relate to with as far as our, our friends or family or, or experiences that we've gone through with some um, body image disorders, some eating disorders, some struggles that we've had. Um, a lot of the athletes in the book, in fact, uh, had to overcome a whole heck of a lot. I mean, and this, this is true. This is, and you know, some of these stories like John Joseph, what he had to overcome and who's now been a plant-based athlete for 40 years, focusing on organic foods, and is now at almost age 60 competing in full Ironman triathlons, and what Laura Klein had to overcome in, in her personal life to be the best uh, do athlete in the world, and, and what I already mentioned, Dotsie Bausch, and our friend Josh Lajani, what he had to overcome. I mean, 
you know, 420 pound uh, former football player who was a complete non-athlete at this point and went on to be inspired by Scott Jurek and others and lose 240 pounds and be a 180 pound ultra endurance runner and not only run, but win, like win a a hundred mile race after being formerly 420 pounds and, you know, just be destined for a a life of struggle and poor health. The, The idea that these stories are aspirational we have, we have numerous athletes who th- their careers literally were over. I've ended, over, done. Too much inflammation, too much soreness, too much pain. It's over. A plant-based diet brought their careers back. And, and some of them are thriving right now. In fact, playing on the world stage in, in tennis right now because they were able to do this. And that's what I think is so unique about these stories is that we get the curtain pulled back. We get the inside scoop. We get to know what they're eating, what they're feeling, why they came to a plant-based diet, and how it's benefited them. And to me, that makes a book about about nutrient density, calorie density, protein, carbohydrates, fats, supplementation recovery, really, really fun. I mean, I can't get enough of these athlete stories. And I haven't even mentioned some of my very favorite ones, like Sonia Looney, and Robbie Ballinger, who ran across America in 75 days. Imagine the fuel and recovery you need to run 43 miles every single day through all kinds of different uh, environmental conditions, through the desert, through the mountains, through the wind, rain, snow. It's, uh, there, there's something there that just inspires the reader to say, you know what, I want to give a little bit more effort. Um, even if that is just going for a hike. It just makes me, as a, as a reader, it makes me want to work harder in the gym. It makes me want to make more deliberate decisions when I purchase f- groceries. Like, what is this food going to do for me? Is this food hurting me or is this food helping me? Is this decision getting me closer to the dreams and goals that I claim to care about? And that's what we nailed with this book. It's, it's one of the most fun uh, books you're going to read on a plant-based diet because the stories come to life on the page. And, and that's what's, what's so beautiful for me. Robert, just listening to you, I'm ready to get out there and play some tennis. So I'm going to get ready for Wimbledon. Let's go. Let's play some pickleball, man. Play some pickleball and then eat some pickles afterwards. Like, let's take action and make it happen. We got My main man. Let's go, let's go man. Um, this is awesome. I, I'm uh, excited to dig into all these stories. And... I, I love what you're talking about. I mean, we listen to podcasts, we watch documentaries, we watch movies to get inspired by these, you know, amazing athletes. And here's an opportunity to tap into athletes who also get the nutrition component, which a, a lot of us are, you know, a lot of people are missing. So you talked about motivation, inspiring people, and other than, you know, picking up the book and reading these stories, what can the, the everyday person do to stay consistent and get motivated and actually start moving their body on a regular basis? So uh, I think we probably have slightly different approaches here. Robert can talk about uh, what will get you all amped up and, and ready to go, which, which is what he does so well. Uh, I, I, have, I have this, I guess, more of a practical kind of like habit change scientist approach. Not that I'm a habit change scientist, but I, I, I have a sort of a sciencey background. So I like, I like repeatable systems and things like that. And to me, the way to get started, and I'm going to sound like a broken record, it's to, it's to make it, build a habit by starting really small. If you don't want to kill yourself with a workout the first day and, and set your new gym routine where you're going to go for an hour a day for the first week or, or forever because it kills you after the first week. You, you don't go back. It just doesn't last. Uh, so like if, if you haven't moved in a few years or done barely anything or even if you have been kind of active and you set this goal that you want to run a 5K or run a half marathon or whatever, it doesn't have to be running. I'm just using this as an example. Like you should try to run for two minutes a day at first and for a week and like don't let yourself run anymore as long as you've got the time to do this and you've got the patience and you're not in some you know urgent medical condition where in which case you probably shouldn't be running anyway yet (laughs) but uh you know like go do that Teach, teach yourself that you can keep that tiny tiny promise to yourself and if you find yourself missing a day in that first week when you're supposed to just run two minutes then then don't increase and make it even easier say my goal for success is to get out the door with my shoes on my running shoes on and that's it. Like literally, and I know everyone says like, well, that might make you do some more. And that would be great if it did make, because you're not likely to take the shoes back off and just go right back in the house. But you might. And if you did, it would be success. You're teaching yourself. You're starting to wire a habit. Every time you do it, you're telling yourself that I keep my promises to myself. And you're telling yourself that I did this. I did this exercise. I'm, you start to think of yourself as someone who does exercise, who shows up at this time. 
there's all kinds of different habit change tricks and things you can do. But to me, starting small is, is really what it is. So like you just do that two minutes, then the next week, let yourself go for five minutes. And if this is working right, like you will want to go more than that. And I even suggest that you don't let yourself like make it really fun so that when your week is up, you're really pumped that next time you get to go for 10 minutes or seven minutes or something. And like, you just totally flip the script of like, wow, this is terrible. I hate having to go out and run for 10 minutes or run for 20 or whatever. If you can like actually show that restraint and make the steps that small, uh, I just think it's, I think it's a totally different mindset when it comes to exercise. And to me, that's how you build a habit. It's, it's very, very hard because it's hard to be that patient. It's hard. Like the results don't pile up in the first month when you're running two minutes for the first week, then five minutes, then seven minutes. You don't see any physical results, but the results are going to be in your head. Your head is changing. You're building a habit. You're adding a wire to that neural connection every single time you do it so that you're building this foundation that's going to have you still running a year from now or five years from now. Uh, or maybe it's not running anymore. It's some new fitness habit. But you're building this foundation that says, I do exercise. I'm someone who's fit. I'm someone who's active. And so you're not going to be as far as the person who just goes crazy out of the gate after, at the end of month one. But at the end of year one, you're going to be the one who's still doing it, whereas the person who just goes crazy has, has given up and tried nine other you know, diets and programs by then and, and given, them all, given, that, given them all up as well. So again, like I said, broken record. I'm, I'm all about the small steps approach. Uh, but Robert, why don't you tell us how to, uh, how to get, how to take action to make it happen? Yeah. Well, you know, I agree with a lot of that, Matt, of course. And if, in fact, perhaps, you know, most or all of it, and, and we talk a lot about that in the book, but we also talk about this three letter word that is incredibly important. And that is why, like, you've got to look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, why am I doing this? Why do I care about this? Because let me tell you right now, who cares about health? Who cares about fitness? Who cares about wellness? Well, if you do state your case, show me. Show me that you care. Show me with some behavioral change, with some desire, with some goal setting that you're going to do it. There's a reason why New Year's resolutions end on January 17th on average, because like Matt said, we set goals that are just not realistic. We don't have the capacity to do that. We, we, we can't always adapt that fast. And then we're, we're sore, we're tired, we're unmotivated. The results didn't come. Hey, how come my body didn't change completely to this before and after photo within, within 17 days? I'm going to give it another 11 and a half months and try it again next New Year. Um, that doesn't work. So I think what we have to do is, is, is really in a detailed way, answer that question, why? And, and be as, as brutally honest as possible. And sometimes th that hurts. Sometimes it hurts to reveal why we want to make a specific change in our life. But by doing so, we can have honest communication with ourselves, and then we can make some specific goals. And then furthermore, this is one thing I've never really talked about, but in, in my early years as an athlete, uh, I, I kept a journal and every single day at the end of the day, I would write something that I was proud of, um, whether I ran for 20 miles, whether I did a hundred pushups uh, a day for like my 300th consecutive day without missing it, um, or whether I was a, a good teammate to someone that day, or whether I, I made a priority to eat specific food that day. I, I would not let a day go by without documenting something that I was proud of. And what that did for me was made me feel good and accomplished. And there was some sort of reward mechanism to that. So, and it wasn't external. It didn't come from anybody else. Nobody even saw, nobody even saw the journal. It was something that I kept for myself. But at the end of the day, every day I could say, I'm proud of what I did today. And, and I think about that. Am I going to be proud of what I did today? And, and I still think about that to this day. And that, and that does keep me motivated. And then what I do is by answering that question, why, and setting some specific goals that have deep meaning to them. Not just, oh, I want to look better, it's completely meaningless, or I want to feel better. Again, completely meaningless. Why do you want to feel better? And what measurable ways that you can, you know, that you can just feel, that, you can, you know, that are tangible, practical, uh, that will change your life in some sort of way? You answer those questions, and then you come up with that, with that plan. And we talk about that in the, in the book as well, how to come up with realistic goals and then how to work toward them, like Matt said, where you make these incremental steps, and all of a sudden you feel better. Like nobody runs a marathon tomorrow if you've never run, right? But you run down the street. You run down your driveway. The next day you run further down the street. The next day down the street and around the corner. The next day down the street around the corner into the park. This is how you do it. You know, I've put on 100 pounds as a plant-based athlete. I know that's something most people want to do the opposite. They want to lose weight. But I wanted to be a bodybuilder. That didn't come overnight. That took, that took deliberate actions every day and believing, you know, in my, in my head and in my heart that someday I could do this. And someday I could be a champion bodybuilder. And, and I did, and I became that. And it was because I could connect the dots and I could visualize it. 
And so I think uh, obviously most people, the goal is for most people, just statistically, the goal is, is weight loss, uh, more energy, uh, disease reversal and feeling better. And so we can take actions that are meaningful to do that. And a plant-based active lifestyle, you don't even have to use the word athlete, a plant-based active lifestyle is something that supports that fully. And that's what we've you know, spent years dedicating our, our lives to and then pouring it into this book that is the universal resource for that. If I can just add one thing here, Robert, um, I don't want people to, to mistake what I said or what you said to mean you should set small goals because you mentioned the New Year's thing and you said that people you know, might set goals that are too big. It's not really that people set goals that aren't, that are, that aren't realistic. Uh, it, it's, it's that they try to do them too quickly. Yeah, the timetable. Right? Like, like, yeah. right. You said you were 120 pounds and you said you wanted to be a champion vegan bodybuilder. Like that's no small, tiny little vision. <laughs> right. Right? That, that's way different from like take a step out the door, like I said, with your shoes tied and call that a win. Right. Uh, but those can both be part of the same thing. You can have this huge, giant vision for, and you should have this huge, giant vision. You shouldn't have the goal that just says, I want to walk out the door seven times in a row or I just want to lose some weight. Like that, that's not a, an inspiring vision that's going to get you out of bed or off the couch or out the door. The one that's inspiring is when you imagine yourself crossing the marathon finish line or, you know, that's what it was for me. But like it could be, it could be any kind of athletical or even non-athletic, just some other goal that requires physical fitness. Um, you should have that goal in your mind. Like that's what's going to help you have the patience to go slowly at first, to take just a little bit of steps. Like realize it's all for that. It's not just for, you know, whatever the next little step three weeks from now is. So by all means, have huge, giant, exciting goals. Uh, don't don't limit those at all. Just give yourself the time. Set a reasonable timetable, if possible, to, to make them happen. And to reflect on those, I, I just want to add this really briefly because I posted it on social media two days ago and I got a tremendous response. Maybe it was yesterday. It was to reflect on that. It, this thing I posted, just, just a little meme, but it said, if the version of yourself five years ago could see you now, they would be so proud. And it's, it's, it's that kind of thing. You do these things every day and you're like, wow, I have accomplished a lot when you look at it over time. You know, like I've wanted to be uh, this, that, or whatever for so long and, I, and, I'm, and I'm getting there. I'm closer. Like, like we've had aspirations of being writers and, and, and here we are with a book in every major bookstore in America. Like that didn't happen overnight, right? It took, in my case, self-published books. It took, you know, you working with smaller publishers. It took all this work and this book itself, years of writing. But look, like we got there, right? And you can, I love that you said, what did you say? Um, oh man, what did you say? Something like uh, two minutes a day or two miles, two miles a day. That's exactly what I was told as an aspiring writer, write two pages every single day. And soon you've written a book. And you, you just said that earlier, Matt, something like two minutes a day or two actions per day. Mm -hmm. Th that is how you become a champion vegan bodybuilder or how you, you qualify for Boston marathon. You do these little things every day and they accumulate over time. And there you are. And it's about being patient and understanding the big picture, connecting the dots, and having a vision, and, and just working toward that every day until you eventually you get there. Robert, you put on a hundred pounds. Yeah, as yeah, a yeah. yeah. hundred. Yep, yep. This I'm is where, if you're listening to the audio version, you need to go to YouTube, and you're going to see a before <laughs> and after picture because we will put that there. Yeah, and I ha uh, and I have plenty of those. It's extraordinary. I have plenty of those uh, photos, Cyrus, because I documented this my, my whole life. I mean, furthermore, Cyrus, I weighed 89 and a quarter pounds in eighth grade, and that's documented. I still have the medical form when they check you for lice and they you weigh you and do all these things. I, I have that. So when I became vegan, I, granted, I was only age 15, but I weighed 120 pounds. But I, I wrestled the next year at 133 as a junior, and I graduated high school around 140, 145. I started weightlifting in the 140s almost 150 pounds. And recently I, I've been as heavy as 223 pounds, you know, with clothes on. And that may seem like, well, that's, it's the wrong direction you want to go in Robert. Right. But I had a, I visualized that as a teenager. I'm like, I used to be a big fan of pro wrestling. I'm like, man, I want to be, cause I'm six feet tall. I, I'd see these wrestlers at six feet tall, 220 pounds. I'm like, man, that would be my ideal thing to be this big muscular guy. And sure enough, you know, uh, decades later, that's where I ended up. But, and I did it, but I did it in a you know, in a, in a healthy way. I mean, I mean, Matt just saw me in person. I, I feel like I'm a pretty healthy and fit 220 pounds, you know, I mean, I don't know if it fits on the screen, but it's, uh, it's, it, yeah, I don't want to break my you shirt. Just, I gotta, you know, gotta go shopping. Your again. arms are things my legs. Just one of them. <laughs> well, and I've, if I worked at that, like I knew we've had this book coming out. So I've, I've been consistent for an entire year 
even during pandemic, even during gym closures, I, I just, I made it a priority and I know Matt did too. And, and uh, those are the things that you answer the question why, and you work towards something meaningful and you have the result to, to show for it. And that's what I think this book demonstrates in, in dozens of athlete examples, because we all have different goals, right? We all have different dreams. We all have different aspirations. We all have different body types. We have different ages and different genders and different backgrounds. Like it's not one approach fits all, as Matt said. It's it's something that you you, you take a little bit of pieces from here and, and, and this story and that story and that story, piece them together for yourself, and and you find something that works for you. Cyrus, it's so funny to hear. Like sometimes they're talking about these segments. I'm like, they're like headlines in our book. One size fits no one. Like <laughs> your right. chapter four is carbohydrates are the perfect fuel. You're like talking about your why. We have an entire section about the why. Like this is just fantastic material. <laughs> yeah, this is this is great. Here's what I would like to see actually for you guys. Uh, could you do a video where Robert is benching Matt? You, th- you think you do that? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I could, I could, I could, I could bench Matt and Robbie at the same time. Um, I sure. one each hand, just yeah, yeah. I would almost, yeah. almost, almost. I use a, a 110, 120 pound dumbbells in each hand, but that's for dumbbells with barbell. On decline press, I can press about 330 pounds because you don't have to balance. You don't have to balance the individual dumbbells. You have the barbell, so I can do about 330. I'm working my way up to to much more, of course. Um, so so yeah, I bet you know Matt and Robbie probably 330 combined or or so or less. So Matt, uh, Robbie you Robbie Barbello. <laughs> <laughs> Robbie Barbello. Oh man, See that's a that's a Barbello. That's a good one. That's a good one. I'm, I'm not even going to say my turning the other cheek joke now. That was that one won the day. Uh, I weigh 150. So I'm 160. I so I, 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 can, I can I can press you. I can press you guys. We should do that. That okay, would be a good cool. exhibition. <laughs> I would love to see that. that would, I would pay money to watch that. Okay. Here's, here's my last question for you guys. Um, uh, it can be confusing, I think, uh, to try and figure out what foods to eat in order to construct a well-rounded, fully balanced, nutrient-dense diet, right? Are there – if you're an athlete and you decide that you're going to go either begin running training or you're going to go to CrossFit or you're going to become a bodybuilder or – you just want to go play volleyball at the beach with your friends, right? Are there certain foods that athletes are supposed to be eating more so than non-athletes? Or is the type of diet that a person living with diabetes or heart disease would eat, is it similar to what you guys would eat or what another plant-based athlete would eat? Yeah, that's a great question, Cyrus. Um, we kind of started the conversation with with that premise that like it, it really is very similar. The same foods that support short term recovery, lack of inflammation, they're the same foods that, that support long term disease prevention. So you could completely take that diet and become an athlete with it, and not change a bit, and and you'd be fine. I mean, I would say like as you as your caloric burn starts to go up, let's say you start burning an extra 600, 800 calories a day you're going to need to get those calories from somewhere. So you need to eat larger portion sizes. The portion sizes, though, becomes kind of a problem because it, it becomes hard to eat. That Just plants aren't, that very, aren't very calorically dense. They, they, don't, they take up a lot of room in your stomach relative to the amount of calories they're providing. So it becomes hard to eat a huge, massive portion of one meal. So you need to start choosing more calorically dense foods. So like that's when, if, if you've decided you need to get more calories, you might start to you know, have, rather than such a huge salad, although you should keep eating your huge salad, but like get some more calories from sweet potatoes or beans or even some nuts and seeds. Like you can, you, you want to get some more calories that way. Another way to do it would be eat more frequently, which for me has, has worked well. Like whenever I need to put on weight, the answer isn't completely stuff myself at mealtime, which I, I still try to do, but like that doesn't really, it's not very effective because I can't eat that many more calories by trying to completely stuff myself with whole foods. I just need to eat more frequently because you're going to find that you digest these foods pretty fast anyway, because they all are, are you know, nutrient dense, not very calorically dense, and they just happen to digest quickly. So the, I would say like, uh, just speaking very broadly, athletes are going to tend to eat more calorie dense foods than non-athletes talking about people who eat plant-based diets already. Uh, it doesn't mean you need to ha- start having oil or anything like that. Like, I mean, you know, you could, and some athletes use that, but you don't need to, it, it just doesn't have to be part of your diet. You can, you can get that from the nuts and seeds. Uh, if you want more caloric density in whole food form. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's one, like you, athletes need slightly more protein than non-athletes. Um, it, it's, I've, I've heard before that it's simply due to the increased caloric needs, their, their protein, you know, if, if they, if they're going to get 15% of their calories from protein or whatever the amount they've chosen it to be, uh, 
that's going to go up if your total caloric intake goes up. Your, that 15% that is going to equate to more calories if, if the total pie is bigger. Um, some people, though, will even say, and I've seen some studies recently that say, like, athletes actually need a, a slightly larger percentage of protein. Um, but, but none of this is going to require, like, you know, loading up on protein powder or anything like that. Protein is in all these whole foods. I'm surprised we haven't talked about protein yet. Honestly, it's very strange that we could go this far into a plant-based athlete conversation without protein, but maybe, <laughs> uh, maybe our audience already knows that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be, it's like, you just start shifting your diet a little bit more perhaps towards some beans, certain grains. Uh, I mean, there's protein all over the place in a plant-based diet. You, you really don't even need to look for it unless like you have a very specific goal of, of getting a lot. So yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of it. You can add all sorts of super foody sort of things that will help you with recovery. Like, you know, I mentioned beet juice or beetroot powder earlier. Those are good for athletes and it's a healthy, it, it's, it's basically a healthy sports supplement that doesn't have any downsides. Um, there's, there's tart cherry, like that's a great anti-inflammatory ginger, turmeric. These are also really good anti-inflammatories, but so are some of the other plant-based foods. So like they're very optional supplements if you're looking for that little extra boost. Um, but yeah, I mean, otherwise it's, it's not different from a, from a mastering diabetes diet, uh, in any substantial way. Yeah. I think the only, the only emphasis perhaps is just being really deliberate with your, you know, pre and post workout nutrition making sure you have the fuel, the energy to get a great workout and making sure you're replenishing uh, carbohydrates, electrolytes, water, uh, and amino acids, the building blocks of protein after a workout. And uh, those are all, you know, the same foods that Matt's, Matt already mentioned. You know, the very common bodybuilding foods are things like potatoes, sweet potatoes, broccoli, rice, oats, uh, you know, and mainstream bodybuilders just throw in, you know, chicken and fish or something or chicken and beef or something. Uh, but the, the, the fuel is, is there, you know, the, the from the, the complex carbohydrates and you can, you can emphasize walnuts or blueberries or cherries or whatever's in season. I know, uh, I know Robbie's always got Miami fruit company on the top of mind. <laughs> He's always got something new, uh, some fruit I'd never heard of to share with us in, in the internet world. And that's, and that's great because sometimes those foods, are things that you can discover and like, wow, that's a great pre-workout. I'm, I'm tired of just eating bananas all the time. I'd like to have some other dense fruit. I didn't know about this one. I'm going to have that now. And, uh, you know, that, other than that, like Matt said, it's the, the diet is, it's, it's the food, the food, the food. It's always been the food as Dr. Clapper said. And so if you just eat the foods that you enjoy and get a great, uh, calorie intake based on your calorie needs, you're going to meet all those other goals too. your protein, fat, carbohydrate intake needs, and you will, you know, hopefully uh, thrive with a plant-based diet and really enjoy it and stick with it for the long haul. All right, Matt, what's your favorite post-workout recovery meal? Go. Ooh, uh, in the very, very immediate time after workout, I like to uh, have, you know, any kind of anything that's just going to replace the carbohydrates. So like, I don't know if this is mastering diabetes or not, but uh, like a, a bowl of white rice with some soy sauce on it. I, that's just, that's exactly what I'm craving after I have depleted all that glycogen. And then later on in the day, uh, two hours later or something, I'll have a, I'll have a good healthy whole food vegan pizza um, with like a, like a Parmesan sprinkle cheese with, made from nutritional yeast and cashews, uh, whole grain or sprouted crust, tomato sauce. That's, that's a perfect way to end a long run. I love it. Okay, cool. Uh, Robert, favorite post-workout recovery meal? Go. Yeah, for me, it's a burrito bowl. Uh, you're talking rice, beans, avocado, lettuce, tomato, salsa it's it is filling it is nourishing it's satiating it's calorie dense it's protein rich it's amino acid rich it's carbohydrate rich and i'll have some sort of beverage uh as well it could just be water it could be coconut water it could be uh you know something slightly flavored but that's the ticket man that's the ticket is to <sighs> eat something like uh like a burrito bowl um and, and i actually plan my workouts in the afternoons or evening so it's dinner afterwards right so i could be eating thai food i could be eating ethiopian food i could be eating mexican food uh international cuisine indian food that that just speaks to me and hits checks all those boxes and so i like a post workout meal as dinner <laughs> cyrus do i get to share mine i was just going to ask you what is it it's Mame Sapote from Miami Fruit, Robert. <laughs> Mame <laughs> Man. Calorie dense that, fruit. That's Let's why go. I call Robbie Mame Man. Robbie is Mame Man because he's the Mame Sapote. Robbie Barbell. Oh, uh, <laughs> Barbella. Okay, so I, I would like to guess Cyrus's answer. It's going to be one of two things it's going to be it. either chickpeas or mangoes. I mean, which one is it? Oh, very good point. It's neither. Chermoya. Oh, wow. Ch Shocking. Yeah. Chermoya. Nope. 
It's the largest acai bowl that I can get. Ah, my head. okay. Yeah, basically, like any kind of smoothie bowl that's just got like a bunch of berries, fruit cut on top, maybe some like ground flaxseed, uh, and uh, maybe some cocoa nibs. I mean, I, I lose my mind when I eat that kind of stuff. So why is that so that, underrated? Yeah. Why is why is fruit after workout so underrated? Like. Here I am, a 220-pound weightlifter who loves – I already told you my story with Brian Wendell. I love eating fruit after a workout. Uh, yeah. But that, that's not like socially accepted. Like you got to go have this big you know, steak or you know, mashed potatoes or hearty thing. Like really? Yeah. Don't you want to replenish vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, water, f- fiber, uh, phytonutrients all in one nourishing snack like you said, an acai bowl or something and then, you know, and then carry on with your day and have your burrito bowl or whatever like – yeah. So, I mean, the answer is if you're, if you're preaching to the choir, if you're talking to a plant-based audience, the answer is, oh, of course, that's so logical. That sounds like that's something I would eat. No problem. If you're talking to a non-plant-based audience, then what most people do is they equate fruit with sugar. I'm sure you guys have seen this all over the place. Don't eat fruit because it'll metabolize to sugar. It'll raise your blood sugar and it'll cause an insulin spike. You hear this all over the place, right? It's just a gross misinterpretation of what a whole food carbohydrate really is. And as a result of that, people are terrified, absolutely terrified of eating fruit, even if it's if it's before a workout, if it's after a workout, or if it has nothing to do with a workout. And it's just sort of like this pervasive fear and this rhetoric that just keeps on running through society. And I think you guys are going to help rewrite that because, you know, we try to do it as well. And there's a lot of other people in the plant-based community who are doing the same. We just, a podcast before this, we talked about exactly that, that, that there's this internet conception that fruit is, is sugar is therefore bad. When uh, the Global Burden of Disease study, I think in the early 2000s, said that, that like that was the, the number one cause of, of our society's health problems was not enough fruit. Correct. But but if the internet says it's sugar and it's bad, then mm-hmm. what do you? Think? I saw it in a meme. I saw it in a meme, Matt. And <laughs> meme, which is just a you know great word in itself, that is uh, authoritative. Um, <laughs> like the one like the one I posted yesterday about uh, you know, be be proud of your you know uh, former self or your former self be proud of you today. <laughs> like that's that's scientifically true. Um, we all feel a sense of pride right now. I'm sure the four of us, because <laughs> the meme said yep. so. So yeah, <laughs> so you know, uh, carb the fruit up, right? I mean, ha- get keep the fruit coming in. Mm-hmm. Like I think it's I think it's fantastic fuel, um, and, and even for post workout. Like I th- just think it doesn't need to be overlooked and underappreciated. And and so uh, keep on keeping on. Mm-hmm. Life's a garden, dig it. Yeah, I love. It. Um, I, I would love to sit down and, uh, have a, actually, I would love to do a couple of things. Number one, I'd love to work out with you guys in person and, uh, you know, just like floor ourselves with like a a challenging workout, whatever it is. And then number two, challenge each other to a pseudo eating contest afterwards and see who can eat the largest post-workout recovery meal. And maybe make a a mukbang video. Is that what it's called? The mukbang video? We we can, we can all tune in from our respective locations and, uh, you know, you just count the calories as they, as they come in. That's right. That's absolutely right. So tell, so tell our listeners uh, where they can buy your book. Uh, do they go to Amazon? Do they go to Barnes & Noble? Do they go to their local bookstore? You tell us. You can go to any of those places. Your local bookstore probably should have it. But if it's the tiniest little independent place, you might want to call ahead. Uh, and that's one way to get it. Of course, you can also go to book.nomadathlete.com where you will see a whole bunch of details about a bunch of bonuses that we are offering with it uh, for orders before June 19th, which is only four days after it comes out. I'm not sure exactly what days this, this podcast is going up, but uh, if you can get it before then, you'll also get some really good bonuses, um, like a little meal plan bonus that Robert and I put together, a, a muscle building guide, a little accountability session that we do, and even a live Q&A with me and Robert. So lots of cool bonuses if you can order it that way at book.nomadathlete.com. Um, which will just send you out to one of your favorite bookstores anyway. Uh, or you can go right to the bookstore and get it that way. I love it. Um, I, if I haven't said this already, I love what you guys are doing. I mean, for the longest time now, it's been, I've been in the plant-based world now for 19 years, 18 years, right? And ever since I made my transition, just like I told you, I felt electrified. I think that's the best word to describe it. You know, oh, sure, my glucose was more controllable. Sure, my insulin use was down. Sure, uh, I was better hydrated and I could sleep better, but I love to move my body, period, end of story. It doesn't matter what day. It doesn't matter what time of the day. You ask me to go do a workout, I'll do it anytime. Like no excuses. I just love it. There's something that's just like very primal about it for me, right? So when I had switched my diet and I felt electrified, I literally was like, why doesn't the world know this? This can be, this is such a powerful, powerful tool 
to enable you to live a more active lifestyle, right? Now you guys are doing something that's really, truly unique because there's so many books on the subject about heart disease and about diabetes and about how to reduce your chronic disease risk overall. But what you guys are doing is you're putting a different spin on it and you're like, no, 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 no. You want to be athletic? Let me teach you a whole bunch of stuff about athletics and we're going to go to a deep dive about that. So I love what you guys are doing. I cannot wait to read this book. And uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for spreading the word and continuing to get as many people to live a plant-based lifestyle as possible and as many people to live an active lifestyle as possible. Literally the two most powerful things that you can do as a human being to live your optimal life. You guys rock. Thank you, Cyrus. Thank you, guys. This was awesome. Congratulations, guys. You're super inspiring. Keep it up. And I wish you nothing but success with this book. And I know it's going to inspire a lot of people. Thank you. And thank you for cool. being part Thanks of our well. journey as well. We appreciate your, your uh, genuine and wholehearted support. So uh, thank you. Thank you.